Very good. Well, uh, first off, I would like to thank all of you for your time. I know you're all volunteering your time. It's very important for um, all of you to get to know us and vice versa. My name is Lisa Paglisati, and I'm a judge in the King County District Court West Division, position one, and I'm running to uh, retain my position. I have been um, a judge for the past six years for the King County District Court. I primarily work in Seattle. I currently preside over the King County Regional Mental Health Court and King County Regional Veterans Court. I have worked in all divisions of our court. Prior to becoming a judge, I was a public defender in King County for 22 and a half years where I worked in uh, the misdemeanor unit, felony unit. I supervised misdemeanors. I worked in the dependency unit as well. Before that, I was a juvenile probation counselor in King County and a juvenile corrections officer. I also did some investigative work prior to that for Department of Social and Health Services through the WIC program. I believe that my breadth of experience um, makes me uniquely qualified to continue in my position. I very much enjoy my position and feel like all the experience that I have, I utilize every day. My judicial philosophy is simple. I treat people with dignity and respect. I hope that those individuals who appear before me, whether they're represented by counsel or are pro se litigants, have an understanding of why I have made a decision, even if they don't agree with that decision. I also believe that one um, can concurrently um, discipline or hold people accountable while at the same time um, providing them an opportunity to rehabilit rehabilitate themselves. And that's um, generally who I am and what I'm about. So I look forward to answering any and all of your questions. Thank you very much. So we're going to have, again, going to uh, four prepared questions and you have two minutes to answer um, any, any of these questions. Uh, Alice, do you wanna start off with the first question? Sure. What are the elements of your background and experience that make you best qualified to earn our endorsement? Thank you. I um, studied sociology and society and justice, criminal justice in college. Um, as working as a juvenile corrections officer, I worked with a lot of youth who had experienced trauma throughout their life. And I got to know those youth pretty well working as their corrections officer. We were sort of parents in that position. I got to see different um, programs that worked. Um, this was back in the early 80s. When I was a juvenile probation counselor, I primarily worked in our screening unit, meaning that I saw people firsthand, sort of a first responder when they got booked into detention, had to review probable cause statements by law enforcement and determine whether or not there was sufficient um, evidence presented to hold somebody in custody potentially. And then I made a decision whether or not to release or detain them. So that role I think prepared me the best in a sense because I had to identify um, you know, the elements of various crimes um, talk to references and decide whether that person should be released pending appearing before a judge. As a public defender, I worked with um, thousands, thousands upon thousands of individuals, again, that entered the system for different reasons, whether it be criminal or whether they were subject to um, child protective um, services proceedings. So I worked in both civil and criminal as a public defender. I was able to see firsthand individuals who uh, were the um, subject of in access to justice and um, see how different needs or how the justice system can affect various aspects of people's lives, i.e. a criminal conviction may prevent somebody from getting housing, for instance. Um, if someone is in custody, they may lose their job. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. Great. Thank you so much. Um, question number two, Shep. Uh, and again, um, Judge, the questions are in the chat if you want to see those as well. Shep, can you uh, lead us on the second one? Thank you. In what ways can the courts better serve those of moderate or low financial means in civil actions? Thank you for that question. Um, our court offers the ability for individuals to ask for their filing fees to be waived whether it be for protection orders whether, or um, small claims proceedings. So we do um, try to keep the doors open to those individuals who have moderate means. Um, a lot of, most all individuals um, who appear for small claims are pro se. 
And so they can come and bring their claim and get before the court, have their day in court without paying a filing fee by filling out a declaration demonstrating a financial need. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, question number three, I, um, Stephanie, are you able to take that one? Yes, sorry, I'm kind of on the go today, but I absolutely can. Uh, if presiding over a criminal docket, what role do you think that judges should take and would you take, if any, in diverting defendants to diversion programs such as drug court, mental health court, and other diversion programs or other alternatives to incarceration? Thank you for that question. Let me explain how our regional mental health court and our regional veterans court work, and then I'll talk a little bit about community court. I did preside over King County District Court's first community court. So community court is um, for low level offenders, nonviolent offenders, where either a judge, a prosecutor, or a defense attorney can suggest that an individual be referred to the community court. At community court, we hold court at a location outside of the courthouse. And in the, in the court that I presided over was in Redmond where we had service providers on site um, in the library right next to the courtroom. Um, and in getting people into that court, it generally the prosecutor has to agree for all of these. They're sort of a gatekeeper with respect to mental health court, vet court and community court, but a judge can suggest somebody go and observe community court. And then if it's determined that they're otherwise eligible and they wish to participate, then they're accepted into that program. With respect to veterans court and mental health court, um, the prosecutor um, for felony cases has to agree to reduce that charge down to a misdemeanor. And then we send people through a screening process with our public health clinician who's part of the team. And then defense and prosecution work on an agreement. And then I see the person once they're deemed to be eligible for that program, enter the plea and we're part, I'm part of the team, the prosecutor's part of the team, defense counsel, defense social workers, in the case of veterans court, the veteran justice outreach, outreach specialists from the VA hospital, the clinicians, et cetera. So it's generally an a short answer to your question. The prosecutor ultimately holds the key to getting someone into most of these courts, but everyone can make a suggestion or a referral. And I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much. Uh, the fourth and final prepared question, Laura, can you take that one? Sure thing. What is your position on bail reform and what factors do you or would you consider when deciding whether to impose bail and what changes would you advocate for, if any, if elected? Thank you. A um, couple of different questions there. Right now in our current system, in order for a judge to set bail, we have to, uh, there has to be a finding that someone's either likelihood of likely fail, to fail to appear to court or they're likely to commit a violent offense. And then um, the least restrictive conditions must be imposed. So a person shall be released unless certain factors are present and bail can be one of those factors. With respect to bail reform in an ideal world, um, I believe that a, pre, a very robust pretrial supervision release program would afford um, community safety, accountability, and would be everyone would have equal access to that. It was a, probably back in the early 2000s down at the Mailing Regional Justice Center, there was a robust pretrial supervision program where after people went into arraignment, they were interviewed by pretrial release screeners and they were supervised, had to do UAs, um, had to check in with people and could participate in services. Ideally, I would like to see that, that back because I think that would allow everyone equal access that would otherwise need to post bail. For instance, if Bill Gates comes before the court, it probably doesn't matter what amount of bail is set, he's gonna be able to post it. Um, if somebody with low means comes before the court, um, whatever bail is set, whether it be 50 or $100, they may not ever be able to set it. But if we have a situation where people can participate in pretrial services, I think it serves a number of purposes. Number one, the individual can avail themselves voluntarily of services that could potentially help rehabilitate them while, they're, while their case is pending, and hopefully they wouldn't come back into the system. But most importantly, it would afford equal access to 
um, pretrial services and being out of custody if appropriate. In some cases, it's not, not appropriate for a violent offense. Great, thank you. We're gonna move on to questions from the e-board. Again, you'll have uh, one minute to answer these. Um, anybody wanna go first, any questions? Um, I guess I have a question. Um, what of the various rotations or different types of cases do you most enjoy um, working on in your time? Thank you. I very much enjoy the therapeutic courts and I've been privileged to be able to preside over the mental health court and veterans court for the last three years and community court for about a year and a half. I will tell you that when you see right before your eyes when services work for somebody and you see somebody transform um, before your eyes into um, letting go of some of the things that brought them into the system, correcting some of those things, whether it be mental health treatment, whether it be substance abuse treatment, whether it be holding people accountable and seeing them proud of where they've come, that is the most fulfilling position I, um, I've ever been in. Um, I had individuals in community court that would never come to court. And when they were in community court, they were excited to come to court and their self-esteem went from, you know, the floor all the way to the ceiling and continued to do well. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura, you have your hand up. I'm curious uh, during the pandemic, what your experience was like um, with vir virtual courts and if you think they increased or uh, decreased uh, people's access to the, the justice system. Thank you for that question. And that's somewhat of a controversial issue because when the Zoom hearing started, a lot of people thought that individuals would not have access to court because they may not have access to the electronics to say appear by Zoom. What I have found is that we have a higher participation rate, higher appearance rate um, when people are allowed to appear remotely. They don't have to take a day off work. They don't have to bring their children to court they can keep their job and appear um, before the court. So the appearance rate has been very, very high in my experience. And I hope that um, that's one positive thing that, came, that will come out of the pandemic is we will be able to think outside of the box and continue remote hearings. Thank you. Um, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Anybody else? We went so quiet. <laughs> um, I guess I'll I'll take a I'll take a question, but um, how how do you define restorative justice, and how do you incorporate those principles into your work? Thank you for that question. I'm very much a believer in restorative justice. I would hope at some point we can get into more peacemaking circles, etc. But I will tell you that part of our mental health court team and our regional veterans court team, we do incorporate the harmed party in that team as well. And um, the harmed party, often called, previously called the victim, I prefer harmed party, where parties will come to court and give their input and they're consulted with before an individual is accepted into the court. So we accept input from everybody. It's um, very fulfilling to see a family be able to reunify when it's appropriate and to allow input as to how someone is doing. Um, again, when everyone comes together, we look at what services an individual needs, that individual Ten seconds. recognizes why they came into the system and apologizes to the community, apologizes to the victim and pays back. And everyone has input is very, very rewarding for all. Great, thank you. Um, Barbara has a question. Yes. I think Barbara's frozen though. And Barbara, if you want to take yourself off video and just ask, sometimes that'll help with the signal if you take yourself off the video. Or you feel free to put it in the chat if that's easier because we're not seeing you or hearing you. Technology is wonderful, isn't it? Oh man, you know, <laughs> there's always there's always something, but um uh, let's see, did she, yeah, we lost, I think we lost Barbara. Um, 
kind of getting down to the last few minutes here. Does anyone have, we probably have time for just one more question. Anybody else? Um, I could just ask a, maybe a follow-up to the previous question. Yes. I'm curious what your thoughts are. I'm sure there's many individual obstacles to, uh, to restorative justice, but do you have a sense of some of the most important state level or policy uh, obstacles that you think need to be tackled? Well, funding, that's a pretty standard generic um, answer, but it's very true. I'm proud to say that um, our legislature has allotted um, a lot of money in this last year for district courts statewide. I, I um, sit on the therapeutic courts committee. So we were able to reach out to a lot of um, smaller communities and counties throughout the state that don't have the necessary funding that maybe King County does to um, start these courts up and a huge response. So um, there's courts all over the states that are starting different um, community courts, um, different therapeutic courts, and that funding allowed them the opportunity to do so. So that's the biggest hurdle always, and to, and to sustain that as well. So um, we'll see if the legislature allots that money um, in the next several years as well. Okay, well, um, we're about that time. Wondering if you wanna give a one minute closing statement. Yes, again, I'd like to thank you for your time and I would be honored to have your endorsement. I hope that I can earn your endorsement again. I've been previously endorsed by the 36 Dems and right as of right now, I do not have an opponent and I hope to keep it that way. And um, I very much am honored to serve this community and I will continue to do the best job that I can if reelected. So thank you. Okay, so uh, Judge Paglisati from all of us uh, at the 36, thank you for coming down here. I guess coming to <laughs> on here onto this virtual space on a Monday evening and appreciate your time. Thank you for chatting with us.